In the name of the Father, the Son, the Amen. Uh, Pope St. Damasus uh, for today, uh, quite the figure in the history of the Church, uh, not uh, really popularly, but in terms of just uh, when he was, uh, his papacy, a lot of important things happened, uh, which we'll see. Uh, but first, a couple of uh, other minor saints. Uh, there is Blessed Franco of Siena. He's not, not even a saint, but a blessed. And he was um, born in the 13th century uh, to Italian nobility, and he lived a rotten, horrible life as a dissolute soldier. Uh, and this continued until he was stricken blind. And uh, uh, having lost his sight, uh, caused him to uh, undergo one of those great, um, we'd say, blessings of God. I don't know if you call it a midlife crisis, but a crisis of his life. What have I done with my life, right? I, I mean, you could, you could uh, really think, he probably thought, my whole life I've been blind. So we asked God to restore his sight. If you restore my sight, he said, I will change my life. God restored his sight, he changed his life. Uh, he went on pilgrimages all over Italy. He went to Compostello. Um, in fact, it says that he visited the house of Loretto which was amazing because that was the same year that he died, he, uh, he visited that, that house. But, um, but he changed his whole life, and he sought out the advice of holy persons. Eventually, he retired from, from life to become a hermit. He lived nearby a Carmelite monastery, and uh, Blessed Franco, uh, having uh, been a dissolute uh, um, uh, soldier, uh, was now a visionary. He had the gift of prophecy, and he had visions of our Lord and Our Lady and the angels. And um, he died in 1291, uh, like that same year that the House of Loretto was translated. Uh, that's the same year he died, and he managed to, uh, to visit that place uh, before doing so. And he died on this day, uh, 11 December, as I mentioned, in 1291. Another interesting uh, uh, saint for today is St. Daniel, the stylite. Uh, that's those ones that live on the pillars. And he became a monk in uh, Egypt at the age of 12. <clears throat> and he lived in this monastery until he was 38. Uh, the, the, the monks there ch wanted to choose him to be abbot, but he declined. And he went and he visited St. Uh, Simeon, the stylite, and he received the blessing from that saint. And then in, in, in determining what he wanted to do with his life, he decided he too would become a stylite. And so he traveled to Constantinople and built a pillar there and ascended. And uh, this shows that, you know, the, the saints give their life to Christ for um, the prayer that he said before ascending. Uh, he said, I yield thee glory, Jesus Christ my God, for all the blessings which thou hast heaped upon me, and for the grace which thou hast given me, that I should embrace this manner of life. But thou knowest that in ascending this pillar, I lean on thee alone, and that to thee alone I look for the happy issue of my undertaking. Accept then my uh, pur purpose, strengthen me that I finish this painful course, give me the grace to end it in holiness. Uh, so he knew that was not going to be an easy, easy way of life. And he was 42 years old when he went on the pillar, and he lived there for the next 33 years. Now this is not without controversy. You might think, how can a, a stylite get engaged in controversy? Well, he failed to check the county clerk's office before building his pillar in the middle of nowhere, and it turned out somebody owned that part of nowhere. And they, they found him there, and they said, hey, I, I own this land, you need to move. But he's like a stylite, I don't, I don't do anything, this is where I am. So the person petitioned to, uh, it was the emperor of Constantinople, to have him removed. And so instead of the emperor coming, <clears throat> the uh, patriarch of Constantinople came, and instead of removing him, uh, he ordained him a priest, right, right there on top of the pillar. He did an ordination ceremony and made him a priest. So I, that's probably the last thing that that person expected. Uh, so then St. Daniel became, uh, was ordained a priest on the pillar, and he lived there, uh, as I mentioned, for the rest of his life. Uh, he came down only once, and that was to convince uh, the emperor, the Byzantine emperor, not to be taken uh, in by the monophysic heresy. Uh, but he uh, would stand every single day until he collapsed from exhaustion through the rain, the snow, and the freezing cold. And due to this continual um, standing, it says that his feet uh, swelled and were covered with sores and ulcers. And so just before his death, he gave the following uh, advice to his disciples. Hold fast to humility, practice obedience, exercise hospitality, keep the fasts, Observe the vigils, love poverty, and above all maintain charity, which is the first and great commandment. 
Keep closely bound to all that regards piety. Avoid the tares of the heretics. <clears throat> Separate never from the church of your mother. If you do these things, your righteousness shall be perfect. And so he died uh, having lived a holy life. And many people, many um, visitors had come to his, uh, his pillar and received healing by touching the base or being uh, taken up to him. Uh, so thus the life of the holy stylite, St. Daniel. And so now moving on to uh, Pope St. Damasus. Uh, he had the papacy beginning from 366, uh, which he held for 18 years. And he it was uh, that helped it uh, to issue it through that difficult period of growth following persecution. So as we know, the um, uh, church was granted legal standing in the empire in the year 312. Uh, but then during his reign, uh, uh, Catholicism actually was made the official religion of the whole empire. Uh, now that changed things. Um, but we'll see. So he was, his beginnings was he was a deacon from a young man. His own father had been a priest. And so he had served his father as a deacon and then himself became a priest and he served uh, Pope Liberius. And after Liberius died, he was chosen successor, as I mentioned in 366, but not unanimously. Um, there were other loyal supporters of Pope Liberius and they thought that Pope Damasus wasn't a good enough successor. And so they ordained their own. So he had to deal with an anti-pope right from the very beginning. And we might think that, um, oh, let's see. These days, you hear uh, accusations against uh, priests, right? Clerics, all these accusations of, of uh, misdeeds, sins against purity uh, by priests. That's not a new occurrence because one of the things that this anti-pope did to try to get rid of Damasus was accuse him of adultery. So we see false accusations have been around since the very beginning. And so he had, to, he had to defend himself against both the emperor and a synod of bishops, uh, which he did. Uh, but that just uh, goes to show that, um, uh, you know, the difficulties that are attendant upon uh, the office, the episcopacy, right? So priests today, maybe, who have, been, have had false accusations, uh, Pope St. Damasus uh, went through the same thing. So a little bit of solidarity there. Uh, but this, this anti-pope, uh, in addition to making accusations, also uh, raised, um, had armed conflict. Uh, 36 people were killed in this um, uh, violence between the two. The emperor got involved. Uh, it was very, very difficult. Uh, eventually, uh, the anti-pope was banished from Rome, uh, but this was something that would continue to cause trouble for Pope Damasus. Uh, additionally, he had to deal with uh, the heresies of Apollinarianism and uh, Macedonianism, as well as Arianism. He had, had to fight all three of those heresies. And he would call the Council of Constantinople in 381 to deal with those. So he presided over that. Uh, one of the first ecumenical councils of the church. Now, also, uh, perhaps probably the most important thing that he was able to accomplish was calling the Council of Rome in 382, which settled the question, uh, what's the Bible? Right, we take that for granted, right? You got it. You should read the Bible. Well, what is it? There's the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament, what should go there? The Epistle of James, the Epistle of Jude, the Gospel of Thomas, the Shepherd of Hermas, um, the Letter of Saint Clement. Right? Those were questions of the time. This had not been established. We again, we take we take all this stuff for granted. But at some some point in history, somebody had to make that determination. Okay, Pope Saint Damasus, uh, what of the books of the New Testament are inspired? Which ones aren't? How would you like to be responsible for making that decision? Right? That's what the Pope has to do. So he convokes a council. He gets all of his you know the the the, the um, uh, bishops there, the learned men. And uh, among them, this is how God works. He always raises up saints proper to the time. Uh, Pope Damasus chose a very good secretary, uh, his personal secretary, by the name of St. Jerome. And he did an excellent job at the Council of, of Rome there in 382. And Saint, uh, Pope Damasus, this is, this is the mark of a good leader. Damasus saw in St. Jerome such ability and such talent and such knowledge of scriptures that he said, okay, you, you, you did such a good job when we were determining the canon of the scriptures, how about you give us an official uh, translation? Which we didn't have. We had at that time the Vetus Latina, which is an old uh, translation of the Bible uh, into Latin, which was uh, not very good. And so the Pope commissioned Jerome to do a, an official translation for the Bible, uh, which we know as the Latin Vulgate. 
and that still stands as the, the church's official version of the Bible. It is the Vulgate written by St. Jerome uh, at the request of Pope St. Damasus. And that was in um, commissioned in 382. Uh, so what a great, um, uh, uh, I would say, a, um, um, an imp important function to have fulfilled, right, as, a, as the Pope, to give the church her official version of the Bible. Uh, now, at that same time, uh, Pope Damasus also established Latin as the official language of the church. Right, the language of the church is, is Latin. It wasn't always that way. Very often, it was in the earlier centuries, it was Greek. So now he established that uh, Latin as the official language of the church, which again still remains over 1,600 years later. And uh, he also saw, you know, this is difficult. Um, the, the Catholic Church had become recognized as being legal in the empire, and then, then it became the official religion of the empire. And now, instead of having to fight against persecutions and um, executions and plundering of the church, uh, it was a, the opposite problem. Men flocked to the church because it was prestigious, because uh, it was honorable. And now uh, the problem was bishops and priests who were seeking out donations and using it to enrich themselves. So now you have the opposite problem. So uh, Pope Damasus, uh, together with the emperor, um, issued a decree forbidding clergymen to solicit donations uh, from the faithful. Uh, does that, that's, you know, I wish we could have something like that today. Um, but especially widows and orphans were taking advantage of them. So uh, you see that it's, it's always, it's either the, the error is on either one side or the other uh, in the church. It, it's very difficult to hold that middle ground. And Pope St. Damasus was right there at the beginning uh, to help steer that, that narrow course. Among his other accomplishments, he decreed that the Gloria Patri should be recited at the end of every psalm during the recitation of the divine office. Uh, that's something that, that is, um, I mean, anybody who recites the office, it's like, wow, okay, that, that's where that came from. It's just something you always do. At the end of the psalm, you do the glory pantry, thanks to Pope St. Damasus. Uh, as I mentioned, he was um, a <clears throat> vigorous defender of orthodoxy in that time of uh, those various heresies. And he preserved and restored the ancient catacombs uh, where the, the bodies of martyrs were felt, uh, held. There were these um, springs of water coming through. Uh, and, and flooding the tombs, so he had those drained, and he um, decorated the tombs, uh, kind of took care of them. And he himself, you know, they wanted him to be buried there with, with the martyrs and the other popes, but actually he, he, he refused. He was buried elsewhere, and he had a, a plaque instead put up there, uh, which read, uh, I, Damasus, wished to be buried here, but I feared to offend these holy remains. So uh, a very great humility he displayed. <clears throat> uh, he would eventually, um, uh, he would move on to the next life on December 10th in the year 384, and he was 80 years old. Uh, much later, the General Council of Chalcedon in 451 would call him the honor and the glory of Rome. Uh, so he lived uh, a life of service to the church, as I mentioned, ever since a young boy as a deacon, and then later as priest and pope. Um, and he came at a time when the church needed it, needed uh, strong leadership um, in critical times. And so these days, right, this Advent, as we prepare for the coming of Christ, uh, let's not also forget that we are praying for Christ to come uh, through his saints, right? In critical times, God will send those people to, to defend and restore Holy Church until that time when he comes himself, right, at the second coming. So regardless, right, whether we're preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ spiritually at Christmas, whether we're preparing for Christ's literal coming at the, at the, at the end of time, which will happen, or we're preparing, uh, you know, the world by our prayers, our, our, we gain sanctifying grace through, 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 through um, reception of Holy Communion. Um, we, we are uh, advancing the kingdom of Christ so that he can send sa saints into the world, so that he can raise them up in critical times to steer the church uh, uh, through, through the, all the various uh, dangers uh, um, and persecutions and so on. Uh, we need that very much today, so let's pray for that. Pray for, for God to send laborers to his vineyard, uh, heroes in these critical times. Uh, Pope St. Damasus, pray for us. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.